Think first about two films with very similar titles. I'm talking about Sidney Lumet's Network from 1976 and David Fincher's The Social Network from 2010, both of which obviously share a word in their title. And both are dealing with demonic forces that, as far as Hollywood is concerned, are about to take over their industry, the computer, the tele television, and both of which, of course, offer ways of showing their product. The first film concerns television and more specifically television news. The second film concerns computers and more specifically social media. Uh, here's the funny thing. Despite being written by a television writer, Paddy Chayefsky, Network seems much more appalled about the nature of the product, the nature of the competing media, than the social, social network was. Um, in network, the media is so rapacious and so hypocritical that it will even use a, prophe a prophesier of its own doom in the form of Peter Finch's Hollywood uh, Howard Beale to sell itself. That's the level of its hypocrisy. It's idiotic, um, it's incestuous, um, it's going to turn us all into morons. It is genuinely a satanic force. Social network is altogether more slippery. The people revolving around Facebook in the film, I'm saying, Mark Zuckerberg and so forth, are often untrustworthy, socially incompetent, and mean-spirited. But there's little sense in the social network that the product itself is going to eat us alive. As far as the film's attitude to the big invention goes, it's no more fearful than was something like 1939's The Story of Alexander Graham Bell. It's just a thing, like a toaster, something safe, something that's not going to actually eat a society apart. Um, the movies have always been a great deal more relaxed about computers in the real world than they have about television. I think in 1953, a British film about the advance of television, based on, ironically, a play by Arnold Ridley, who went on to become Private Godfrey in Dad's Army, um, was called Meet Mr. Lucifer. That's the kind of level that we were at with their communication, their interaction with television back in the 50s and 60s. Um, whereas television is going to eat our minds, the thinking machine is, as far as movies concerned, a helpful entity that's going to enlighten the soul. And the further back you go in historical terms, the more benign it seems. If you look at the recent film, The Imitation Game, uh, shows us the computer in its coziest, most awards-friendly awards form. That picture certainly makes no explicit connections between Alan Turing's bombs and the PCs in which pirates will in future watch the Oscar-nominated film for free. Indeed, if you had all arrived from the proverbial other planet and the proverbial 200 years ago, you might think that Alan was, all that Alan was doing in that film, all that Turing was doing, was inventing a code-breaking machine. Helpful text at the end points us towards the miserable, his miserable decline and the ascendancy of the computer. Um, but there's no questioning the machine's worth. It's clearly a good thing, and these are good things. With all this, you might feel that film has reached an accommodation with the computer, um, that they're getting on just fine. The oddity, of course, is that when addressing the computer in a speculative mode, when looking at what it might do in the future, um, the movies have been nothing but hostile. All is dystopia. No utopian ideas are really allowed. That's boring. Utopia, utopia is boring, but, which is true about all science fiction, to be fair. I mean, th there are very few interesting uh, utopias in science fiction, and the utopias that you do find tend to be satirical. Tell me computers are going to take over the spaceship, <laughs> they're going to take over the world, they're going to kill us, that's more interesting. That's something you can flog to Peoria. When films haven't been prophesying doom doomed by a computer, they've been trying to make us feel bored with the machines. This, again, is the real life. Um, is there anything more boring than the visual trope of eight good-looking actors sitting around a PC watching a grey bar fit fill up? Um, that's something we do in our real life. That's the awful, wretched present, which we might come back to later. As far as the speculative science fiction world goes, it's much more exciting. It's the malign annihilators that figure most conspicuously, um, which we can have fun with. The great central myth of artificial intelligence in computing, in films rather, is the sorcerer's apprentice. Um, it's the convenience that takes on a life of its own and ends up making slaves of us, and making us or making us dead. 
Literary science fiction has had a few cracks at this. I've had a few cracks at this in the century leading up to 2001, The Space Odyssey. But it's hard to get away from the notion that when Kubrick made that film in 1968, that a new archetype had been be created. That what I mean by that is that everything else that's come since in artificial intelligence is somehow a reference to that and can't escape from it. The first thing that might occur to us looking at it now it's interesting to note the combination in 2001 in, with Hal of giddy futurism and stuff that they just couldn't imagine. Um, most particularly, when this comes from the fact that to that point, most computers, well, all computers essentially of any power, were vast machines that sat in the basements of vast companies like AT&T or Pan Am or IBM themselves or whatever. Um, and interestingly, funnily enough, Clark and Arthur C. Clarke and Stanley Kubrick, they could imagine computers being clever enough to mimic language uh, and take over a spaceship, but they couldn't imagine them being small enough to fit into space the size of an iPhone. And one of those interesting parts, technologically, looking back at 2001, is when they go back to dismantle HAL towards the end. And you all know this scene. They enter, and they start pulling out little strange plastic objects. And it's enormous. It's this enormous, enormous object. It is very much like the kind of thing that you would have found uh, in the basement at Pan Am or in the basement at AT&T. It's an interesting thing about, like, however big their imaginations were, they couldn't think how small <laughs> the computers would be. Another thing that's interesting about the conception of HAL is an exception of, I, I suppose, to do with the conception of evil in Hollywood cinema generally, is that he had to be, he couldn't be American. He, he's not English either, which is in, interesting. Douglas Rain was a Canadian, who voiced HAL, was a Canadian actor um, known for Shakespearean roles, still alive, as I believe, uh, I, I believe. And he was sort of like the Canadian Livier, this rather grand figure who went to Stratford, Ontario, and did Henry V and so forth. Um, Holly, uh, in, 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 a, in, in, a, in English, in a film made in England with English te technicians, they couldn't quite make Hal English, and they certainly couldn't make him American. So he was this happy bland of being somewhere in between, which is what they thought of, they, they think of Canadians as being. <laughs> what Hollywood, Hollywood has always loved doing is making a character of its AI intelligences. Um, they're always characters in some sort or another. Um, and in fact, what, what inevitably happens to a certain degree is a sort of Stockholm syndrome sits in, sets in. That's to say, is despite how evil they are, that the filmmakers sort of start to fall in love with them. Um, and there's more than that in 2001. Um, so enclosed is Kubrick's world, so cold is his world normally, that Hal, the computer, becomes actually the only character in the film. I mean, if you think of those bland uh, astronauts who are these blank actors who never really did very much afterwards. I mean, the only other person in the film you've any interest in is Leonard Rossiter, who turns up for about 10 minutes in the spaceship. Hal is, is warm enough that he can be the warmest thing in a Stanley Kubrick film, which is not very warm at all, but it still means he's the most interesting character in the film. As I say, 2001 is a sort of foundation myth for the rapacious computer intelligence in cinema. All others bear some trace of, to use a terrible current cliche, its narrative DNA. Um, Sometimes the personified computers do work reasonably nicely. They're not always evil, but if they're not evil, they tend to be in the background. Um, I'm thinking of creatures like creatures. I use the word myself. I'm thinking of entities like Mother uh, in Alien, and more recently Jarvis in the in the Iron Man films is a classic example of the largely benign in artificial intelligence, which, again, in the background, not the center of the film. And interesting, Jarvis in the comics, if I remember correctly, was originally a butler. He was originally a human butler. And that's really what the benign computer is allowed to be in science fiction. He's just, or he or she, for example, mother, lurks around in the background and helps the characters do what they do. Though, mind you, I noticed in the, <laughs> the trailer for Avengers Ultron, Age of Ultron, do I have that right, um, coming up that, um, that uh, Tony Stark's robots are going to go mad, obviously, because that's what technology does, as we've established in films, and take over the world. So perhaps Jarvis is going to revert to form in Avengers Age of Ultron. Um, where else do the machines take over and destroy us? The Terminator films gave us Skynet, uh, a machine network that gets angry with us and decides to wipe us all out. 
And James Cameron did get at something here that you don't get in 2001, and even though the film um, was made a long time ago, was made a quarter of a century ago, the first film, he already had got something about how computers were changing. What's crucial about Skynet in Terminator um, is it's a network. And this is something which, again, in 1968, when they made 2001, but hadn't quite grasped. The real danger probably, well, it probably isn't a real danger in that, in that sense, but if there is a real danger, it's more likely to come from a network of computers that begin talking to one another rather than one big monolith that sits there and decides to destroy us, like the Mekong in Dan Dare. Um, that's, that's probably how it's going to work out. Um, more interesting in terms of evil, though, if we can ascribe evil to computers, which Hollywood does, because again, as I said earlier on, they're all, all essentially entities of one sort or another, is, is the Matrix. Um, because it added, I think, spice to that digital conspiracy by having the machines degrade us in ways that, though less destructive than Terminator, were more insulting than that all-out war. They were ruder. Um, they had worse manners. It's much more personally degrading to be turned into an enormous dream machine than it is to be blandly wiped out. There's, these are the decency to wipe us out. There's one, one of the things that Cameron got at, I think, which is quite nicely in that film, was just, just the insidious rudeness of machines. Um, they just haven't been brought up as well as we have. Um, it was a shame the later films were so poor in the, term, the Matrix sequence, because that's a good idea that really had lots of energy in it that could be exploited and really wasn't. The truth of destruction by computers is probably likely to be much more benign. Um, and We'll do this again in a few minutes, but I think in many ways the, most, the film which gets as the most likely form of destruction by a computer is not one of the greatest films in the 1980s. It's probably John Badham's War Games, um, which is a very simple notion, a simple notion that you have computers which play war games and maybe they might get out of control and might launch nuclear weapons because that's a much more likely way of destruction. We have the technology to kill ourselves. The issue is probably not going to be computers conspiring together to, work, to come up with a complicated, our complicated demise. It's far more likely they'll use technology we built, we built for them to kill us, which are the nuclear weapons. And War Games, I think, is a simple film. It was a very simple structure. But it probably got a greater truth about how that kind of destruction is going to happen if, unfortunately, it does. Because what cinema is, in this area, quite poor at is getting at well, it's OK at getting at enormous meltdowns between humans and artificial intelligences and machines. It's always annihilation, this and apocalypse, that, and so forth. Um, it's the notion that we might have a mere falling out is something that it's found harder to get at. And that's one of the reasons why I think the recent film Her by Spike Jones is quite good to lever into this conversation. Um, as far as the technology goes, um, one of the interesting things about her, which I'm sure you'll know the plot if you haven't seen the film, uh, Wacom Phoenix um, has a small handheld computer with an operating system that speaks with the voice of Scarlett Johansson and essentially falls in love with the operating system. Um, the, one of the interesting about the technology, I think, is that it seems awfully, awfully close, but really it's still a world away. That, again, if you go back to our proverbial person from 1900 who visits and looks and has a look at this, if he saw someone standing on the street corner talking to Siri um, on his iPhone, and then watch the film, he'd probably think, gosh, they're, they're nearly there. When in fact, there's really a huge gulf that with Siri, what you're dealing with is essentially just another form of interface. Um, with Samantha and her, you have something that apparently could feel emotions, that has an independent thought, um, that can go off and find other people. That it's, it's a, it's, there's a huge gap there. Anyway, the point is that um, that film did manage to imagine something that a mere human, these machines again all are always human, a, mere, a human breakdown between the user and artificial intelligence, the kind of breakdowns we have with people. Maybe she will drop, drift off with these other entities. Maybe you will care that she does that. And that, I think, is the interesting question that's being asked more and more often and is the best question that cinema is currently asking about artificial intelligence. Um, the Turing test we heard a lot about recently, uh, not least because of the imitation game, uh, and that is to do with uh, how we might 
tell whether an intelligence is artificial or is real. Um, films and books have been asking a different question for quite a long time, which is that would it matter to us emotionally if we discovered that an intelligence was artificial? Um, her offers one answer, The Terminator 2, where, as you recall, Arnold Schwarzenegger comes back in a more, more benign entity, um, also comes up with an answer. In cinemas currently, you've got Big Hero 6, well, today, Big Hero 6, you have the um, new animation from Disney. Um, last week, you had Ex Machina, um, uh, the first film, Douglas Garland. And they, again, come to the conclusion that if the interactions are sufficiently efficient, sufficiently effective, we might not care about the fact they are artificial. Of course, we probably would, but all films essentially do sell us fake consciousnesses. Um, none of this is real. Ethan Edwards in The Searchers is no more real than Samantha in the operating system in her. So what I'm getting at is the movies would say that, wouldn't they? Because that's what they're in the game of doing. They're in the game of selling us false consciousnesses. The movies can believe or would like to believe, or could convince themselves to believe, that we really wouldn't care if we discovered that these things aren't real. Um, among the other, other interesting things about her is the way it combined the speculative approach to computing technology with cinematic efforts to engage with technology as it exists today. Um, as we've seen, we're still, still a awfully long way from producing the kind of machine with a soul, but the bits and bobs that Wack and Phoenix plays with there do look quite familiar. I mean, funny enough, they, are, they look more to be designed in Brooklyn than Californian campuses, but that's more to do with Spike Jones than with any attempt to actually what, to anticipate what, films will, what, what technology will look like. Um, that's where that world comes from. The least happy, that's all fun, that's all good, that's all, we can all play around those things, they can be exciting, they can be dangerous, they can be fun. But the least happy and the least involving engagements with computing and film tend to involve those that really try to make meaningful connection with the computer as it exists now, um, that really do try to show us, and that we really try to introduce into stories how we deal with computers, um, or indeed to talk about the way they've changed lives. We already have an established conceit that helps filmmakers deal with, for example, the volume of communication that takes place in texts, Twitter, Facebook, and so forth, because that's an issue, is that that's how people communicate now, and therefore filmmakers feel they have to somehow reflect that. And the conceit that's grown up the last sort of five years or so is words on a screen, which done quite well um, in the Sherlock series, and done a lot less well in the recent Jason Reitman film, film Men, Women, and Children, which is sort of a key text, unfortunately, in this conversation. Um, this is really the current example of that split-screen te technique you used to get in films in the last century when, trying, when lazy directors were trying to get telephone calls on screen. You remember in Pillow Talk, for example, you'd rock Hudson on one side of the screen, and then you had his girlfriend on the other side of the screen. They were communicating across a divide, and then Doris Day would pop up in the corner because they were sharing the party line. That sort of thing. That's the sort of uncinematic cinematic technique you have um, with words on the screen, which you get throughout men, women, and children. And it's not even new as a notion. The whole 18 years ago, Patrick Marber uh, wrote the play Closer, and they had sir titles there throughout, demonstrating in how they were communicating in internet chat rooms, which sounds like something from the 12th century now, doesn't it? But there were such things, and it was, still, it was felt at that point that internet chat rooms were something you had to introduce into theatre. But Patrick Marber knew that wasn't a new language that was going to change theatre or film. That was a kind of groping around to get at a new way of communicating that would work once or twice, but couldn't really become a convention. The other thing you get in Men, Women, and Children, which um, uh, goes a bunch of, along a whole bunch of stories um, in an American city, you have a girl who's put pornographic images of herself on, on to the net, you have people who are obsessed with, with one another, various kind of scary plots about what's going to happen to us all. Um, what you get in that film, which is interesting, and which I think we'll probably see less of, but it's still, ha happening, still happening now, is the contemporary version of Reefer Madness, which was a 1950s film about how marijuana was going to turn uh, all your children into beatnik maniacs. Um, and the current version of that, which you get here, is that the net, and computers more generally, 
um, is going to turn all our children into sex starved, sex crazed zombies. And all this goes nowhere. Um, the only solution to finding ways of driving an action that minimize the communication by smartphone or tablet and address it is to actually make it your own. When filmmakers came to make, to adapt pistolary novels such as Les Dangereuses or Dracula for that matter, they understood that and they finessed the action into properly cinematic exchanges. There was no need for panic then, no one thought letters were going to take over the universe. But there was, but they managed and they knew that they had to integrate them into cinematic patterns. Filmmakers are in charge of the medium. They're the boss of other media. They don't, have to, don't need to take it from the upstarts. They need to beat them into shape and mold those media to their bidding. Um, you will see fewer Twitter conversations in a film than you will encounter in real life. Of course you will. People don't go to the lavatory as often in films as they do in real life. Their cars always start. Whenever they phone up somebody, they're always in. It's not real. That's how, those, are one, those are ways in which you structure the world to the cinematic universe. Um, now, I was said earlier on we talked briefly about war games, and we've talked about some classic films, and we've talked about some weaker films. But truth be told, the most telling example, I think, looking back, and I was sketching through this yesterday, thinking about this history, of Hollywood jumping on board the Computer Express and shaping its passage to their needs was a pretty humble film from the 1990s. A very successful one, but a pretty humble one. Um, there's nothing much remarkable about You've Got Mail. It fits very neatly into the Meg Loves Tom template that um, we find very common even by that stage. Um, it was based on a very superior film from the 1940s, uh, Ernest Lubitsch, A Shop Around the Corner. But it was the first example of a computer communication being seamlessly and convincingly slipped into a classic Hollywood form, into a classic Hollywood genre. If you want a film that shows how these machines engage with lives, you don't look at the social network, because that's about the boffins. That's about the people who put it together. Um, you don't look at her, because that's too far ahead of the game. Um, you have to look to unthreatening, humble, but very effective, you've got mail. Um, it's not the sort of film that changes lives, but it recognized how lives were changing. But what Hollywood wants to do always is to engage with a violent energy. That's more fun. They want to, what it wants to project more than anything else currently is the perennially hopeless genre that is the cyber thriller. And we know where that leads, you've already said it. Eight nice-looking men and women gathering around the screen, watching tensely for a grey bar to fill up. It, never in cinema history, it's a funny thing, has an everyday annoyance become such a staple of supposedly escapist entertainment. Um, watching the grey bar, to, waiting for the grey bar to fill up is for most people akin to cleaning cat shit off the sofa or remembering to put out the rubbish or cleaning the loo. It's one of those daily annoyances of modern life. Um, yet somehow it's become something that's going to stand in for excitement. Um, who on earth wants to see Chris Helmsworth doing that when you could do it at home? Not very many people, if you look at how many went to go and see Michael Mann's Black Hat last week in the United States. But there's a belief out there that cybercrime, hacking, and other digital stuff like that are the outrages of the, the day, and that therefore thrillers must deal with them. I think we, we have the trailer for Black Hat, do we? Can we watch that now? Taiwan, and that's just what we know about. To catch this guy, we're gonna need a black hat hacker named Hathaway. He's a 
genius coder serving 15 years. If you want my assistance, I want you to commute my sentence. Have any idea how much progress you're gonna make on a strike this complex without someone like me? Zero. This isn't a negotiation. Well, I just made one. This is the code section right here. It looks incomplete. He's still writing, but what for? The guy we're working will take out a city and not think twice about it. Don't have old 9-11 on me. Stay down! China, now Chicago. This is only the beginning. Is he political? Any terrorist declaration? No claim, no statement. The ways he want. This isn't about money. This isn't about politics. To you, this is all just a game. A virtual world. You are never in the game. Whatever's next is right in there. Can you crack it? Isn't that why you brought me here? You get discovered, you're dead meat. Do you know what your guy did? Hack into the NSA and defense. Bring him in. You have to run. I'm gonna stop him. With a guy this dangerous, it's all about if I can get close enough, fast enough. You're no longer in control. The real hit is still to come. I think it looks awesome, actually. <laughs> it's, it's got terrible reviews, but I think it looks absolutely awesome. Um, check will be in the post from Universal. Um, anyway, before I close and get to the reason why I showed you that in particular, um, one thing we have to just address quickly and explain to Hollywood if they're listening is that they think that such films should be about hacking. They think such films should be about cyber terrorism. They shouldn't. Those things are what Hitchcock used to call MacGuffin. If the film is working, then they're like the plutonium in the wine bottle in Notorious, um, the various n secret messages that pass through, whatever the hell North by Northwest was about. And the reason we watched those films is because we like seeing Cary Grant interact with Eve Marie Saint, or you know, we like watching um, Jimmy Stewart following Kim Novak uh, about San Francisco. It's not about the plutonium in the wine bottle. It's about the old-fashioned values of storytelling. Why I suggested that was interesting was that we, through this conversation and through this morning, we've been discussing the notion of how cinema and Hollywood, mainstream cinema in particular, interacts with the computer. And that shows how it really does. Because you look at all those stunning backdrops, look at the great speedboat chases, look at how slickly edited it is all. Michael Mann, director of that film, director of Heat, and that has always been in love with technology. He shot digitally before anybody else shot digitally, um, when it was still regarded as things that student filmmakers did. He's happy to use computer-generated effects. Half that film was is CG. Half the trailer was CG. Um, like everybody else now, though Spielberg held out until quite recently. He edits um, on a di digital editing program. Films are so soaked in computing technology that they are now essentially pieces of software. They are part of the computing industry. They're made with computers, and to an extent they're made by computers, which is a way of saying that Skynet won after all. Skynet now runs Hollywood. Hasta la vista. <laughs>